In this video, I'm going to share with you how to make an offer on a house wisely. Hi, I'm Phil Pustiowski with Freedom Mentor. You can learn more about us at freedommentor.com. You can watch some more of these videos. Um, as well as, you may want to pick up my book, um, How to Be a Real Estate Investor. It's on Amazon, a best-selling book. And in this video, I'm probably going to share with you some things that are a bit out of the ordinary. This is probably not what you expected from a training on how to make an offer on a house. But I think by the end, you're going to be excited. I think by the end, you are going to see just how much better this way of doing it is. And I think it's also going to click in your mind that it's common sense. I mean, this is not rocket science, what I'm about to share with you. Um, it's going to click. And so I want to start this off with a story. I'm going to share with you a recent example of a seller that I just met with about a week ago. And let me just lay down the facts. The facts of the deal were this person had inherited the property. It was her and two other siblings. And they were all a third, a third owner. And they had just become the official owners on title about a month ago. So after the passing of their mother, it took a while before the probate process, they ended up you know, becoming the owners. And so the uh, previous owner, in this case the, the, the deceased mother, she had a loan on the property for about 40000 It was a HELOC, so it was interest only. And um, 40000 was owed, and they may have been a few payments behind uh, by the time that she had reached out to me. They also owed some money in property taxes because after the mother had passed, the property was no longer a homesteaded property. In Florida, uh, your, uh, your taxes go way up when your property is not homesteaded. So uh, there are some back taxes on there. And what had happened was when I had talked to her, um, she had shared with me that you know they just need to get rid of the property right now. It's vacant. And let me tell you what most people would have done. Because I've seen it. I mean, I've been training people for so many years. I, I know what most people do. Because I see the questions people ask me all the time, especially the ones that are not part of our program. Like, they're always asking me, how much should I offer? What should I offer? What should the offer be? Well, what most investors would do is this. They would not even have asked how much was owed on the property. Most of them would have said, okay, you want, and so what she said over the phone was that she wanted 60000 And so if you went over the property, you would have saw that uh, it needed a lot of work. So what most investors do, and what most people do when they're making an offer on a house, is they get the address, they look at how much it's worth, they look at how much needs to be done to fix it, and then they make an offer. Isn't that right? That's how it works, right? Figure out the value, get the address, so you can just look it up so you make sure you know exactly what property you're dealing with. You look at exactly what kind of work needs to be done, you calculate how much work needs to be done, and then you make an offer, right? Okay. That is a terrible way to do it. I call that phrase, spilling your candy in the lobby. Spilling your candy in the lobby. And if you hear some kids in the background, that's my children having a good time. Um, and no matter how big the house is, somehow you can still hear their screams. Okay, so. Spilling your candy in the lobby. How do you do that? It's real simple. When you simply get the facts of value, repairs, and then you calculate an offer, and you throw that offer out, that's called spilling your candy in the lobby. Because if you would have made an offer on this particular house, you would have had to have offered like $25,000, $30,000. There's no way you could have offered more because it took at least 10000 to fix it up, if not more, and to sell it for maybe sixty five, dollars what it would have really sold for, if you actually wanted to make a profit paying closing costs and everything, you would have had to have offered, you know, around 30000 But the thing is, is she owes forty. dollars They're just not going to accept it. They're not going to, they, they owe more than, the, than, than what you would have offered. Does that make sense? So the big key to making an offer wisely is this. Are you ready? Great. You have to get a great understanding of the situation. You need to know everything you possibly can about the situation. You need to know, you need to know exactly how much they owe. You need to know whose names are on the loan. 
You need to know how much the mortgage payment is each month. You need to know why they're selling, what's going to happen if they don't sell, where are they moving to, how difficult is it going to be for them to move? How long have they lived in this home? Do they have sentimental value with the property? Do they hate the home? Do they like their neighbors? Do they hate their neighbors? You need to know as much as you possibly can. Because when you do, you then can structure an offer that fits their needs and also makes you a profit. Does that make sense? It's a very different approach. Most people don't do this. What most people do is they want to talk to the seller, get, a, you know, get off the phone as fast as they can so they can figure out the value, get the repairs, and make an offer. And then, you know, they usually say things like 65% or 70% or... This right here, that's a good way to get very few deals done in today's market. Why do I say that? Because number one, everybody's got access to Zillow and Google these days. People know about how much their property's worth. It gone are the days when you could walk up to somebody and they had no idea what the property value was, and so you could offer them just close to nothing, and they would be happy about it, and they would pick it up. Now they just go to Zillow, and they can see almost exactly how much their property's worth. Now I know Zillow's not always accurate, but at least it's in the ballpark. So sellers aren't, I don't want to say this in a new way, they're, they're not stupid. They're smart. So you need to structure offers that fit for them, but also fit for you. So we're going to get back to my example here. So if you're not going to spill the candy in the lobby, you're going to ask a bunch of questions. Well, what are some key points that I learned? I learned that they owed 40000 Right? That's an important piece of, uh, of information. Next, I learned that their payment was $200 per month. That was the payment. Then I learned that it was the name on the loan was a, uh, you know, so I'm going to say loan borrower was a deceased person. So here's what I, this is what I did. As opposed to offering 25, 30,000, I said, look, I'll pay you, I'll pay you just a little bit above what you owe. I'll see to it that each one of your, um, your siblings, by the way, I'd asked him, I said, how much do you want to have in your pocket? How much do you want to have in your pocket? And I had to ask like eight times before she finally said a number. But before I give any offer, I have already asked them a bajillion questions. So by the time I actually put the offer together, I know that I'm already going into a realm where they're pretty much going to say yes all the way around. That makes sense? So... I said, look, you all can get a thousand dollars each because there's three siblings. So a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. I will pay any any closing costs to get this deal closed, and I'll take over the mortgage. And the reason why I can offer you so much more than anybody else would offer you is because I can take over this loan and subject to and just start making payments on it. And I don't have to worry about hurting anybody's credit because the person's no longer alive. So this particular uh, offer, this person jumped at it. She was like, oh my gosh, yeah. Now her, uh, one of her siblings uh, turned out to be an appraiser, and so they're still deliberating how they can get more money. And I've been clearing them. I'm like, y'all won't get any more money from anybody. I'll be around here a month from now when you call me back because you're not going to get any more money than I'm offering you. So... And the other thing that's important to note about this particular deal was, yeah, it needs a lot of work to fix up to resell, but to get it rented, if the AC's working great, roof's fine, everything in there, the floors are fine, the kitchen's actually pretty nice. I can get it rented out, and I could probably have to put maybe a thousand in cleanup. Um, that's about all I have to spend. So in other words, although you have to offer about thirty if you're going to buy it, fix it up, and resell it. Instead, by learning a whole lot about the deal, I can then come back in and make a different creative offer. So the secret to making an offer on a house wisely is to understand that person's situation at a great, great level. And then some people may, may bring up the question, well, Phil, but what if it's a short sale or it's a foreclosure? How am I supposed to do that? Well, I would recommend you watch my video, The Secret to Short Sales and Foreclosures, but it's the same concept. 
you still have to get a great understanding. In that case, you have to get a great understanding of who the bank is, what the BPO came in at, or what their value they have, and what their percentage of uh, approval is. It's still an understanding. So in other words, as opposed to ready, fire, you know, uh, ready, fire, aim, it's ready, aim, then fire. So this right here is your way of always putting together what is most likely to get accepted. Does it mean every offer is going to get accepted? Of course not. There are going to be deals that just don't go through. This is a perfect example. Sibling number two is just being real greedy. He'll come around, but he hadn't come around yet. Um, but if you put yourself in a position to make wise offers, you're going to get more deals. And you're going to outpace anybody in your marketplace. You'll beat all, you'll beat all your competitors because almost nobody's doing this. I mean, just in general, most people in life, um, me included sometimes, I like to talk, as you can tell, uh, they don't listen very well. <laughs> you can ask my wife. I, I, cause, I, I make this mistake from time to time. you got to listen carefully to the seller. You've got to learn everything you possibly can before you make that offer. You need to listen, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, understand their situation. And then that way, when you make the offer, you already know what they're absolutely not going to agree to. And then you know where some of their buffer zones are where you might be able to get an approval here or there. I'm not saying you give them everything they want, but you can at least structure a deal that's closer to what they're going to need. And a perfect example is this here. They weren't going to accept 30, but they might accept something where they both get $1,000 in their pocket. And it was still going to work for me because this thing was going to rent for... Um, around a thousand, the four bedroom, and the total payment with with taxes and insurance was going to be about uh, was going to be about like four fifty. So my cash flow is going to be five hundred bucks a month. I may have to give them um, a total of say like I was calculating six to seven thousand to close on it, but then I would get most of that money back when I put a tenant buyer in there. I'd require at least six thousand down. So I'd basically get into this deal almost no money down, maybe about a grandy, and uh, I'd be pulling in about. $500 a month positive cash flow. So I'd get my granny back in two months and this thing would be just a cash flowing freight train. So do you see how these things can, you know, when you, when you don't look at this business in a cookie cutter fashion where I get the value, I get the repairs, 65 cents of value, and I hope for a success. No. You ask questions after questions after questions after questions after questions. I mean, just an absolute, I mean, in a nice way, it's a complete interrogation. Ask them as much as you possibly can. Learn as much as you possibly can. That way, like the last thing you're doing is actually making the offer. But it's after you've learned a whole lot. And so for those of you that make offers on the MLS, uh, you know, for me, I, I try to avoid that at all costs. Because there's no way for me to understand the seller's situation because there's a listing agent in the middle. And the listing agent's going to tell you nothing. So uh, that's why I try to avoid that altogether because it's really not a wise way for me to make offers. Even the home I live in. Or this video is being shot right now. Um, you know, I, I work directly with the seller to get this thing right. So, um, anyways, there's your uh, there's your huge lesson on making offers wisely on houses, and uh, it's probably different than what you expected. So, what's the summary? Don't spill your candy in the lobby. Instead, understand their situation, learn as much as you can about what's going on with their situation. That way, when you make the offer, it's as wise as it can be because you've learned as much as you could uh, before you actually threw that thing out there. All right, well, I'm Bill Pustiowski with FreedomMentor.com. And uh, if you have other questions, comments about this topic, feel free to uh, put some comments down below this video. Uh, as you'll notice from my other videos, I respond pretty quickly to these comments. Uh, I enjoy going back and forth with y'all who watch these videos. All right, thanks so much for being on.